Okay. <laughs> Praise God. Good morning, church family. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Well, happy Super Bowl Sunday, guys. <laughs> Are we going to be watching the game? Who's, who's watching the game, though? You're going to watch? Probably. I'm definitely going to be watching. Now, I am not sure what to root for, though. We've got two, two good storylines going on in this Super Bowl, right? We've got Patrick Mahomes, who is uh, trending towards being the greatest of all time. And we have Brock Purdy, who uh, was the very last pick in the draft in 2022. We, you know, if you know anything about football, we call the last pick of the draft Mr. Irrelevant. That is the title that he gets. He is the first quarterback, uh, the first Mr. Irrelevant to be starting in a Super Bowl. So I'm not sure what to root for. Do we root for the excellence of Patrick Mahomes, or do we root for the Cinderella story of Brock Purdy? I mean, I really should uh, root for Brock Purdy because I'm a lot closer to him than I am to Patrick Mahomes, right? Uh, nobody will ever consider me the greatest of all time in anything, right? So, <laughs> so maybe I should be ready for property because I'm, I'm a lot closer to being Mr. Rosen than I am the greatest of all time. But I can't, I can't help but, uh, but want to root for someone to dethrone Tom Brady. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't hate Tom Brady. My quarterback beat him twice in the Super Bowl, so, you know, I, I'm okay with Tom Brady. <laughs> Anyway, so I don't know, what are we rooting for, guys? I mean, that was what's a 49ers fan. Okay, so you were a 49ers fan, so you're rooting for Brock. Okay, Jack, what are you, you're a football fan. What are you rooting for? I, I don't plan to watch it, but if I had to pick a team, I I still have good feelings for Andy Reid. Okay, yeah. so Kansas yeah. City, okay. Yeah, it's a lot. What about you, my lady? No. Um, welcome, thank welcome, you. by the way. Thank you. Thank you. I actually used to be a member here. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I'm leaning towards because it's Andy Reid. Okay. And also, I just like the movie that comes along with <laughs> it. So, <laughs> with the Pentecostals, that's what we're all about. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is the one, the one time of the year where my wife and I will indulge in pizza and Yes. <laughs> so yeah, I agree with that. And you know what? That's a good. That's a good. Uh, a good point. Andy Reid is a lot more likable as a coach than yeah. Belichick ever was, right? So <laughs> I am. I am also an Andy Reid fan. Uh, so I, uh, you know, again, I, 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 you know, if if you ask me what I think is going to happen, I think Kansas City is going to win because that defense is really good. And I've, I've seen many a time where a good defense will defeat a good offense in the Super Bowl. It happens time and time and time again. That's, that's why we always say in sports circles that defense wins championships. So I think Kansas City will win. Um, but I, honestly, I have no rooting interest. I'm a Giants fan. So I just hope it's a good game. I hope it's a good game. I hope there's drama and you know, it leaves us on the edge of our seats. Of the is, is, is that five now appearances for uh, Mahomes in the Super Bowl? It's four. And he's only been in the league for six years. Is that five? Wow. So he's, yeah, he's been to the Super Bowl. This will be his fourth appearance in the Super Bowl in his six years as a starter. So uh, he lost He lost the one Super Bowl uh, two years ago, I think it was. Was it two years ago? Maybe three years ago when uh, Tom Brady won it for Tampa Bay. Uh, he lost in the championship game to Joe Burrow in Cincinnati. Uh, I don't remember what was the other time. I think the, the other time he didn't make it to the Super Bowl was his first year start. If I'm, if I'm remembering that correctly, I'm not 100% on that. But I, I, I am almost certain it is four appearances in the Super Bowl right now. He's, he's got uh, two victories, one loss, and this will be number four. So we'll see how he does. And the Chiefs were in the Super Bowl when, right around when it first started, back in the 60s yeah, they were, they with Glenn Dawson. Yeah, in the 70s, I think it was. Yeah. So it's, it's been a while. It's been a while for them. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, I just hope it's a good game. I'm glad Dallas isn't in. So, <laughs> <laughs> <don't think> <laughs> 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 I'm not watch the Super Bowl. 
I couldn't, I couldn't, I just couldn't watch this movie. So anyway, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> all you Cowboys fans out there, I know you're hurting. I'm a Giants fan. I feel your pain. Okay? <laughs> all right, so today, today we're not talking about football, believe it or not. We are going to continue our series on what the Bible says about money. Now, I will say before I get started, next week, now today we're going to be talking about saving and investing. Next week is going to kind of be a smorgasbord. I'm putting together a, a bunch of subjects that, that I could not find fit neatly into any of the subjects we've talked about yet. So it's going to be kind of a smorgasbord next week of different financial topics that I haven't gotten to yet. Um, now, I don't know if that'll be just a one week thing or if it might spill over into the next week. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but if you also have questions that you haven't that, that you haven't been able to ask because it, it's on a subject that we haven't covered yet, then you know bring those questions with you next week. Uh, you know we're, we're just going to run the gamut of, of financial topics next starting next week. Um, and if it spills over into the week after that, that's okay. All right. And those of you watching on Facebook or on YouTube, if you have any questions on finances. Leave us a question uh, in the comment, se comment section in YouTube, or you can send us a message on Facebook, and we will answer your question next week. All right, for the five of you who are watching. So, okay, so today we are going to be talking about saving and investing. All right. So now, what does the Bible say about saving? Proverbs twenty-one twenty says, "In the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil, but a foolish man devours all." So, if, you know, the Bible tells us that if, if you are spending everything that you make as you make it, you are a fool. Now, I'm, I'm going to add something to that. This is not the Bible. This is just me. I'm going to say that if you spend all you have, you might also be very poor. So, now the Bible does, you know, does talk about poverty as well. So, you know, my mother, uh, growing up, was a single mother. She worked, you know, full time. Uh, and you know, I think I think she made like eighteen thousand dollars a year, and you know that that's not a lot of money today. It was not a lot of money then either. And uh, basically, all she ever all she had money for was rent and food, and that's all she spent her money on. <laughs> she did not have uh, and, you know she didn't have money left over. If she had money left over, it went toward clothing and uh, whatever maintenance was required uh, in the, in the apartment or among the many appliances that we had. So uh, so my mother spent all she had, but that was only because she didn't have much. So uh, I want to make that distinction that this the, this verse isn't talking about those of you who are extremely poor and simply just scraping by. Now, scraping by is a relative term because uh, I am not poor by any stretch of the imagination. My wife and I both work. We are professionals. We make a good living. We are scraping by because we made bad financial choices. So you know, uh, we would we would be characterized in this verse as being foolish because we have spent all we had. Now we are changing that. We have repented of that. We are making changes in our in our lives and in our spending habits. Um, so we do recognize that. We do recognize how foolish that is. Um, so let's talk about savings, right? There are different types of savings. Um, actually, before I continue, did anyone have a comment on that? I'm, I'm hoping that wasn't controversial. I mean, it could be. You never know what's controversial at any moment. <laughs> now, we do have a small group, so I'm relying on the few of you that are here to drive the conversation, okay? All right, so short term savings, and that's the first type of savings. Now, what is short term savings? Short term savings can take two forms. Number one, an emergency fund. Now, uh, this is something I learned about from Dave Ramsey, uh, having an emergency fund, putting away money uh, for emergencies. Now, you know the funny thing about emergencies? They always happen. <laughs> you will not live your life for any length of time without having an emergency. Uh, you lose your job due to a downsizing. You have a health uh, scare, you know, that, that isn't completely covered by your insurance. Um, you know, your car, uh, you're in a car wreck. And you're responsible for your deductible, and you know so on and so forth. So many different things that we can experience that would require an emergency savings account. And even though 
we know that, it, you know, intellectually, we all know that emergencies will happen. For some reason, many of us don't have an emergency fund. Now, uh, the recommendation is that you have three to six months of your living expenses in an emergency fund. Now, I don't know anybody that has six months of their living expenses in an emergency fund, including myself. Now, I have started an emergency fund. Our emergency fund is a small one right now. It's a baby. You know, we call it a baby emergency fund. It will cover any small emergency, um, but we don't have that three to six months yet. Uh, but I'll, give, I'll tell you a little story about how important an emergency fund is. Now, it's been 10 years now. Um, now, 2009, I started at uh, the Kraft Foods Company. Now, you guys know Kraft Foods, they make mac and cheese, right? You guys all know Kraft mac and cheese, right? <laughs> this is right? That's, the, that's their, you know, one of the most famous products. But they, you know, they make Philadelphia cream cheese, they make, uh, you know, American cheese, all that stuff. So that's all Kraft Foods, right? I started with Kraft Foods in 2009. And in 2014, they decided that they were going to outsource all of our positions. And they outsourced us to a company that is based in India. And this company's business model is to take a certain number of jobs and send them to India uh, in order to save money. And our, now knowing this, knowing I, I researched the company that we were being outsourced to. So knowing this, my wife and I set about uh, putting together an emergency spending plan. So we, uh, now I, I was able to uh, cash out my retirement plan. I don't recommend this, by the way. This is why you should have an emergency fund. But we didn't have one at the time, so I, I did cash out my, uh, my uh, retirement plan. We paid off a bunch of debt. Over that next year, we paid off even more debt. The goal was to get to a point where we could live on one income, because we thought that I would be outsourced and be out of the job. Now, at that time, uh, because there were so many companies outsourcing, uh, the government had, a, had a, uh, a government program in place that allowed you to go back to school uh, if you were outsourced, so you could you know, gain new skills. So that was my plan. My plan was to, you know, if I was outsourced to go back to school, um, they would allow you to be on unemployment for a couple of years while you were in school. So I think the max was two years. But you had to be going to school during those two years, and you had to be learning new skills. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was my plan. that was our plan. I was we were we were paying off debt. We we got to the point we got to the point where we could live on one income, uh, and we were we were ready. We were ready for me to be outsourced. Okay. Now during that uh, before that, Kraft. Uh, now my wife and I both worked for Kraft. Right. Uh, at that time, Kraft split into two different companies. My wife went to work for the other company, they called it Mondelez. Now Mondelez makes Oreo cookies. You guys know Oreos, right? So Oreos and saltines, that's what Mondelez does. So they split the company. So I, I went with Kraft, you know, the Kraft mac and cheese and all that. My wife ended up with Mondelez, with the Oreos and, and saltines and all that. So uh, fast forward a year, we've paid off all the debt, but we, we, we worked our plan, we paid off enough debt, we, we were in a position now where we could live on one income. So I was ready to be outsourced. Turns out my wife was the one that got outsourced. <laughs> she was working at one of the leagues in the uh, export division, and they decided to uh, to export the whole export division, and they sent it to the Philippines. Uh, so it was my wife that ended up losing her job instead of me, and I am still working for the company. <laughs> Here we are, 10 years later, I am still working for the same company. Mm -hmm. Even though I'm, you know, I was the one that thought, I, I thought I was the one that was gonna be outsourced. Now, I, I tell that story because uh, we were prepared for it. Now, you don't always know ahead of time that these things are gonna happen. Mm -hmm. Now, we knew, uh, we, we figured ahead of time that this would happen. Now, if neither one of us had gotten outsourced it, Praise God, we would have had extra money. But we were prepared because we had extra time to plan. Now my wife went, now my wife was the one that went back to school because that was the plan. She went back to school um, and, and uh, she went to school for hospitality. And she is now a, a housekeeper manager for a hotel and has been for, for several years now. Um, so 
So it worked out, praise God. Uh, praise God for all the provision that, that, that the Lord uh, had provided for us. Praise God that we had, uh, you know, warning ahead of time that this could happen. Um, but that's, the, that's, that's just to let you know how important it is to have an emergency fund because things happen that you don't expect. Now, we were expecting for someone to get outsourced. We didn't think it would be my wife. That was a surprise. Um, and praise God, we had, we had you know, forewarning. We don't always have that warning. And that's why it is very important that you guys have an emergency fund. That's why the Bible tells us that in the house of the wise are stores of choice food and oil. But a foolish person devours all he has. You know, what the Bible is telling you, uh, you know, back then it was very common that there be a famine in the land. We read about that on several occasions in the Bible, that there was a famine throughout the land. Maybe there was a drought, or, or you know, crops weren't yielding as much as they, as much as they did the year before. And, you know, if, if you were wise, you stored up grain, and you stored up oil, and you were prepared for the famine. Well, we don't, you know, necessarily have famines anymore, but we can lose our jobs. You know, there's, there's a lot of people, you know, the days of working for the same company for 40 years and retiring with a pension are over. You know, it was wonderful while we had it, right, Bob? It was a wonderful thing while you had it, right? Yeah. <laughs> Bob is of that generation, yeah. And Jack, sure. so uh, I've, I've had, throughout my working life, I've probably worked for 10 different companies. Now, I hope this is the last one. I hope not to have to, to look for another job um, when I retire in you know, 15 years or whatever. Uh, I hope that I don't have to look for another job. But, you know, odds are I probably will. And, and when, you lose, when you lose a job, it's not always guaranteed that you're going to get another job that pays the same. You know, you could end up having to make less money. And, you know, when my wife uh, got out of school, and started working again, she did make less money than what she was making when she was working uh, for, for Mondo Lewis. So, you know, again, we were prepared for that. So we were, once she started working, it was actually more money because we had already, you know, gotten our debts down to the point where we could live on just one income. Uh, but she was making less than what she was making before that. So if we hadn't been prepared for that, we would have been in a little financial trouble. Now, you know, over the years, she's, she's you know, Growing in her career and, and her income has grown. So, um, but you know, you know, when things like this happen, uh, this is why people get into such financial straits because they don't they're not prepared. And and I don't understand why we we are not prepared when we know that emergencies happen. We may not know, like I knew ahead of time that it was a possibility that I'd be outsourced. We may not always know that. We may not know what form the emergency takes, but we know that emergencies happen. You know, people get sick, people lose their jobs, companies, you know, uh, companies go bankrupt, or or they make bad choices and they have to they have to downsize, and and that's all that stuff is outside of our control, and so it is important that we have an emergency fund. So I'm going to echo Dave Ramsey. Dave Ramsey always recommends. See, Dave Ramsey has seven steps, uh, set what he calls the seven baby steps of financial security. The first baby step he has is to start an emergency fund, and he says to start it with at least a thousand dollars, just a big, little baby emergency fund that will take care of you know any small emergency that happens, like if, you know you, you, you knock out a tooth and you have to go to the dentist and your dental insurance doesn't cover it all. Mm -hmm. You know it's not you don't have to like immediately reach for the credit card when something like that happens. Now um, the second step is then uh, working your budget so that you have a little extra money every month to put on your debt. And then after that is paying your debts off and, and using the snowball method. The snowball method is, you know, it goes, the images of a snowball rolling downhill and it gets bigger and bigger as it goes downhill and gathers more snow. Well, you start by paying the, the smallest bill that you have because, you know, that gives you a quick victory. So you pay the smallest bill that you have then you take that payment and the extra money that you did pay, and you add it to the next bill. And when that bill is paid off, you take that payment plus the payment you've been making, and you add it to the next bill. And you, you know, build up the snowball until you become debt free. Anyway, so that's that's uh, 
That is the first type of short term savings. It's an emergency fund. Everyone should have an emergency fund. It is it is absolutely a necessity because in our in our economic situation right now, emergencies will always happen. Uh, I was just reading uh, not too long ago that insurance companies are reducing what they cover now because there have been so many disasters, so many things that they've been paying out on that they raised rates and they reduced coverages. So you could have car insurance. And then wreck your car and find that your insurance company is not going to cover the total cost of repairing your car. Uh, same thing with your house. You can have a, you know, an emergency in your house and find that your insurance company isn't going to cover every the cost of, of, of repairing your house or, or you know, whatever needs to be done. Everyone should have an emergency. <coughs> and this goes back to two weeks ago when we talked about budgeting, right? How are you going to build an emergency fund? you got to have a budget. You gotta have a budget, you gotta know what you're spending, you gotta know if you have extra money to put in an emergency fund. And if you don't, you've gotta you know, start reducing your spending in you know wherever you can and and start you know finding a, a surplus in your budget so that you can build up an emergency fund. Alright, I'm done talking. Somebody say something. <laughs> Jack, say something. Well, Marisol and I were actually in a somewhat similar situation. Marisol is a cancer survivor. Um, we were living, I, I had my own row house in the city, but we wanted to move out here. Um, we purposely found, uh, we wanted to purchase a home that where the mortgage would be something that I could carry alone if I, if I need to. So that, you know, and that's, we really <laughs> depleted, we were working with a realtor and we depleted all of the housing that, that they could show us anywhere running from Willow Grove to Glenside. And then we finally did find the home that we're presently in. Um, and that person was selling the house for 5,000 more than we, that than the cap that we had put on ourselves. And so we, we were steadfast because <coughs> even though we liked the house, we just, you know, we weren't willing to go up. And so luckily for us, I, um, and, and God must have blessed us because I was talking to this gentleman and it turned out that we were both, we both went to the same high school. <laughs> and, and believe it or not, that struck a chord with him, and I was okay with him after that. And so he was willing to come down. And so we were able to get our house for the for the cap money that we had, you know, established with ourselves. So it it, it all worked out really. Um, and so you, like you were saying, you know, you you, you need to establish a, a budget for yourselves, and you really need to just don't give in to temptation. You need you need to kind of like say, okay, this is what we're going to do, and we're going to do it. And you know, we'll, if if it means that we need to keep looking, we we do that. But it, it all lucked out for us. So and and that's we're here. Amen. And you know what? That brings up a broader point. And it, it, you know, when we talk about the, our our major principles, right? One of the major principles that we talk about is is trusting God. Right? We, we talked about being content, and contentment is about trusting God in your current situation. And it also uh, it also applies to making smart financial choices. If you are following God's word in your financial choices, God will bless you. You know the Bible the Bible tells us that. You know He He told the Israelites, if you do what I tell you, if you take your Sabbath rest, if you give the land its Sabbath rest, rest. Then I will rebuke the destroyer. I will rebuke the locusts. I will keep your crops healthy. God, God makes that same promise that the New Testament tells us. God will supply all of our needs according to His riches in glory. So, but we have to make smart choices. God is not obligated to bless dumb choices. God is not obligated to bless my finances because I've been making bad choices up until now. 
I've been, I'm, my wife and I have been taking, well, it's not my wife's fault, it's me. I'm the one that makes these decisions because I'm in charge of the budget. So, you know, I, I you know, I plan expensive trips because, you know, I, I find my, my day job so boring. And those are bad choices because we couldn't afford to pay for those trips. And so God is not obligated to bless my finances when I make bad decisions. Now, I have repented of that. And this year I have committed myself to doing things that way, to being a good steward of God's resources. And as I do that, then I know that God will bless my financial decisions because I am doing it His way. The great thing about repentance is, and this is a completely separate subject, but it does apply. The great thing about repentance is that it starts, it, 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 it helps you to start over. God allows you to start over. He doesn't, he doesn't take into account all the mistakes you've made before. He's not constantly berating you over all the bad choices you've made. Once you repent, once you turn around and start making good choices, then God comes up alongside you and he's like, okay, I can work with you now. And he, it doesn't matter what you did before. Now it's going to take some extra work to dig out of a hole, but God is willing to work with you. And that's where trust comes. That's where trust in God comes from. When you make the right choices, when you make the biblically based choices, God will bless you. He might send you to somebody who went to the same high school as you and, and, and uh, give you favor in that person's eyes so they reduce the price of their house to what you can afford. Or, you know, he could have blessed their finances and said, you know what, you know, something happened that they sold their house for more money than they thought they would get or they got a financial blessing of five extra thousand dollars so they couldn't afford it. God can work in any way, shape, or form. And, and you know, that, that's what this whole boils down to, yes, is trusting God, making smart choices, biblical choices, so that God can partner with us. And if, you know, and that's the key. If you make the smart choice, God will partner with you. If you make the dumb choice, then a lot of times God's going to say, all right, let's see how this goes. You know, it's the same thing we do as parents, right? When our when our children make stupid choices, we might tell them, "Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that." But if they are absolutely determined to make the choice, sometimes we just sit back and go, "All right, go ahead. Let's see what happens." And that's exactly what God does, because He is a good Father, and sometimes He knows we need to learn from experience. You know, it's, it's not always enough to just say no, 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 no. Sometimes we need to learn by, by seeing why it was a bad choice. So praise God. Anybody else? Go ahead. I like uh, the ministry of uh, Dave Ramsey. Mm -hmm. He comes up with solutions. Okay, and Christians should be on the cutting the edge of solutions. Absolutely. And one opportunity I think is here. For Christians that God has blessed with money, they can set up a ministry, a nonprofit organization where they can have apartment houses where rent is really low for newlywed couples that want to save money to buy their own house. Because rent is so high right now, you can't save hardly to buy a new house. So this would be a, a, a ministry where the rent is low, just enough so that you cover your the owner coverage expenses, not making a lot. But it would be for uh, couples that are just starting out that want to sign a five-year contract to save money so they can get into a house. And you, you, don't, you don't open it up to uh, single-parent families. You don't open it up to college students. It's just a ministry for encouraging people in the church to build a family the right way. Well, a couple of things on that. Uh, first of all, there are ministries like that. Uh, for all Great. different types, so not many, but there are they are out there. Uh, second of all, there one thing that a lot of these ministries find is that once you start helping somebody, they expect that help over and over and over again. And, and a lot of times, people will not make the, take the steps necessary to stand on their own two feet. This is the problem with uh, welfare as well. Uh, welfare is intended to help people who have uh, financial issues. Uh, it was never intended to be a lifestyle, but it has turned into that for a lot of people. And, and it's not just a lifestyle for one generation. They pass it on to the next generation. Now, that is something my mother fought against throughout her whole life. 
my mother, my mother lived on welfare for two years of her life uh, that I remember because she got laid off from her job and she needed to go back to school to upgrade her skills uh, before getting another job. And as soon as she graduated, she immediately got a job and closed her case. That's what welfare is for. That's, that's what it's intended to be. It was never intended to, to support you for your entire life. Um, you know, uh, now look, uh, sometimes it takes a while to make, the, to make the right choices, to do the right things, to, to get into a financial position, and especially uh, recently, where we've had such high inflation, uh, and that's what a lot of people are hiding from. And, and let's remember one of the things that we said is God's economy is based on compassion. So we need to have compassion on people who are falling behind through no fault of their own. It's just that things have gotten expensive. Look, my wife and I, it's just, there's just two of us in, that, in, in the apartment now, right? We spend, uh, I would say, almost $1,000 a month on food for two people. I remember not too long ago, maybe just a couple of years ago, we could spend less than $500 a month for the two of us. But it's, that's just the way it goes. Everything is more expensive. You know, so yeah, I mean, we do need to have compassion on people. Um, but to, to, to Bruce's point, uh, we should expect them to take steps, to take steps to better their situation. And that's, that's I, I think that's the thing where, where we have our biggest uh, our biggest conflict, uh, not just in the church, but in society in general, is none of us. None of us have a problem. I don't think anybody has a problem with helping people. It's it's uh, some people have a problem with perpetually helping people and them not helping themselves. Go ahead. And when you try to help people, the problem is they become desperate because there's so many vices they can fall into in society, and that's the problem. And, and you know what, I had that experience because I, I uh, several years ago, I, I tried to help a, a homeless couple that I had just seen on the street. I, I stopped and, and I, you know, I talked to them. I, I got them food out of our food pantry. I gave them some money. Um, but I, I subsequently learned that the, the, you know, the, the husband was an alcoholic. And you know they kept calling me asking for money because he needed a drink. And I'm like, no, you don't. You don't need a drink. And so I had to stop helping them because of that. Uh, so now I you know, I just try to help ministries that do help the homeless uh, rather than trying to help people directly because I don't know what the, I don't know what their story is. And I don't want my money going to to feed an addiction. No comment. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, vices. You know, uh, people say you can't legislate morality. Well, you know, they legalize gambling. And people, instead of putting that money aside for an emergency fund, they'll go buy a lottery ticket. And that just gets under my skin. I mean, if you have financial problems because of gambling, go to the politician's house that legalized it and ask him to help you. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll go beyond that. I mean, I, you know, when somebody tells me they, they can't afford food, but they're smoking a pack a day of cigarettes, I'm sorry, I have a little trouble with that. Now, look, I have compassion on people who are there. I do. I have compassion on people. I know how hard it is to quit smoking. I, I don't have compassion on someone who's not willing to try. Especially if you are that poor. If you can't afford food, then you shouldn't be buying cigarettes. And, you know, you should be buying food instead of cigarettes. Uh, these are different... We're, we're kind of getting off the topic, but these are important things. Look, the church, uh, I, I, I want to emphasize that God's economy is based on compassion. Sometimes the most compassionate thing you can do for somebody is giving them a swift kick in the behind. You know? <laughs> Sometimes. Not always. Not Sometimes. And not literally. And not literally, yes. <laughs> not li a literal kick in the head. Yes. We're talking figuratively. <laughs> Yes. I, I just want to jump in here. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting, and I, and I can look at it from all different angles. Um, and I think that, you know, we, we need to be cognizant of, you know, I hear people all the time say, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps. But if I don't have the <coughs> bootstraps uh -huh. to begin with, mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to 
might do that. Absolutely. Um, and, and so just, just to, to be mindful that, um, you know, there are people who are struggling with all types of, of different things and that, you know, I, I, I try to, if, if I cannot help them with resources, at least pointing them in the direction of where to get that help. That's right. right. So that person who is an institution, alcohol bank, have you thought about going to a meeting or, I don't know, whatever the, the help is that's out there. Now, if they're refusing that help, that's a different story. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the dividing line, right? Yeah. Uh, and that's why I continue to emphasize, every time we do the subjects like this, I continue to emphasize God's economy is based on compassion. Compassion first. It's not the, the kick in the pants first. It's compassion first. You start with compassion, and then and then you see you know you see what where God will lead you from there. Well, Matt, I, I tell people all the time, no one started out in life saying I'm going to be the best drug addict ever. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to be the greatest alcoholic that ever walked the earth. Mm -hmm. No one, no one that I know of started out like that. Yeah, and and nobody sets out you know with the goal of becoming homeless. You know, so we do need to have compassion on people. Um, but again, once you do have compassion, once you start giving them a hand, I expect them now to take steps. Uh, look, sometimes the steps are baby steps. Sometimes it takes longer than, than it, you, know, you think it should. Every situation is different. Um, but as long as they are taking steps, I'm willing to help. Uh, if they stop taking steps, if they are not willing to take any steps, like if they just outright refuse to get help, then you know what? That's where the kick in the behind comes in. It's like, look, I can't help you until you're willing to start helping yourself as well. Because my resources might be better used on someone who is willing to, to do something to help themselves. And, and But we always, always, always have to start with compassion. That's the, that's the, uh, <clears throat> that's the, the, the thing I have with, with certain Christians, they don't start with compassion. They always start with the kick in the pants, and that's not what God's economy is about. God's economy starts with compassion. So let's let's remember that. Let's start out with compassion. Now, if they need a kick in the behind, then so be it. But let's at least start out being compassionate with people, because that's how God feels about them. That's what that's what God's. If you read uh, the Old Testament, and God's commands to Israel. And you read what Jesus had to say about uh, giving and, and helping others. You know, it always starts with compassion. All right. Anybody else? It's good. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So the second type of short-term savings is saving for a purchase or a vacation. Something I should have been doing <laughs> instead of putting my vacations on my credit cards. Right. And that's what we call short-term savings. You have a goal. Like right now, my wife and I are looking forward to our 30th anniversary. Our 30th anniversary will happen in 2027. So we've got a little over three years. So we are starting right now to plan because we want to take a nice trip at that time. But we are planning it now so that we don't make the same mistake we made when we went on our 25th anniversary trip and have to put it on a credit card. We want to be able to pay it outright and not go into debt for it. So that's that's our short-term saving goal, is to take a nice uh, a nice luxury trip for our 30th wedding anniversary. Uh, so we're starting to plan that now, three years and, and three months beforehand. So we're gonna start saving, we're gonna pay off some debt first. So that's, that's our plan for these first two years, 2024, 2025. We're gonna pay off uh, quite a bit of debt using Dave Ramsey's debt stole. And then in 2026, we're going to start saving for that trip that's going to happen in 2027. That's our plan. Now, look, any number of things could happen and derail that plan and make us have to downsize our plans, whatever. But we'll deal with that as they come right now. That is our plan. And we do have a budget. <laughs> you know, I, we've lived on a budget. I've lived on a budget since I started working. Okay, folks? Uh, now, full disclosure, I haven't always followed the budget, but <laughs> I've always had it. That's where it begins, guys. That's why I started uh, two weeks ago with the budget. Before we started talking about giving, 
last weekend before we start talking about saving. You need to have a bunch. You need to know what your resources are before you can start saving. Uh, so, uh, but that's that's the other type of short-term savings. Now, there's also long-term savings, right? And uh, Proverbs 27, 23 to 27 says, Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. For riches do not endure forever, and a crown is not secure for all generations. When the hay is removed, and new growth appears, and the grass from the hills is gathered in, the lambs will provide you with clothing, and the goats with the, with the price of a field. You will have plenty of goats cooked to feed your family and to nourish your female servants. So this is talking about long-term planning. Is you're planning ahead for the time when maybe food is not less food is not as plentiful as it is right now. So during the times of plenty, you save up for you know possible times when when your income isn't as high. And I'm talking specifically about saving for retirement, right? This is something that we all know that we all want to retire, right? We all want to stop working full time. Uh, maybe we want to, you know. Now, personally, I'm not going to stop working, per se. Uh, in my retirement, what I look at in retirement is doing what I want to do rather than what I have to do. You know, the job that I have right now, my gig job, is, is a job that I do because it, it pays well. I don't enjoy it. I'm good at it, and I give, and I give it my all, uh, but I don't like it. Now, when I am retired, then I would like to become a college professor, So, which means I have to go back to school. At 65, 70 years old, I'm planning, <laughs> I am planning on going back to school. Okay, I, I have no problem with that idea. Yeah, when I retire, I'm going to go back to school. I'm going to get my master's degree and hopefully a doctorate, and I'm going to teach in college because teaching is my passion. I love to teach. You know, God has gifted me with the ability for you to teach. Teaching is my favorite. Absolutely, I absolutely love to teach, which is why one of the things I really love about this format that we started doing here, where it's not just a sermon that I'm preaching at you guys, where we're having an open discussion, it's more like teaching than it is about preaching. So, and I just enjoy that. I enjoy teaching uh, very much. And I discovered that uh, when I went back to school, and I did not know how much I love teaching until I went back to school. I was 33 years old when I went back to school. And I got my bachelor's degree. And one of the classes I now several of the classes I took, uh, their their final exam took the form of doing a written and oral report. So you did the written report, and then you had to present it to the class, and of course you had to ask, answer questions. So you were basically acting as the professor that day. Never enjoyed college more than those days. Those times when I got to get up in front of the class, present my my information, and answer. I, I left those classes feeling more alive than I've ever felt in my life. And I realized I love teaching. Now, look, I, I cannot teach children because I don't have that kind of patience. It, it is a gift. Let me tell you something. Now, and I'll tell you something. My brother, Emmanuel, has that gift. I have never seen this before. But it is, it is a spiritual gift, my friends. Children are literally drawn to him. When he starts to speak, they stop what they're doing and they listen. <laughs> I'm like, that is absolutely a gift. I remember we had a, a, a reunion at my old church many years ago. And all the kids were getting really rowdy and, and, and just running all over the place. My brother, on his own, decided to get up and he gathered them together. I couldn't believe my eyes. They literally stopped what they were doing. They went, they gathered around him, and they were like riveted with what he had to say. When I do that, or when I try that, I mean, they're just yelling, screaming, and going all over the place, ignoring me. I don't have that gift. Now, I can teach adults. Because you know what? I can tell an adult, shut up. I'm done. You know? <laughs> and I'm not going to hear from their parents, right? Maybe I will. I don't know. These days, the college students, right? But I, you know, I would rather teach adults, and, and uh, you know, I absolutely love teaching. So that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm doing with time. So now, you know what? You know what I'm going to need to do if I want to put that. If I want that to happen, I got to save enough money so that I can live and pay my bills, so that I can teach part time in retirement. Uh, because I'm not going to make a lot of money doing that. You 
know, so I have to have enough savings to generate enough income. So that's that's the long-term goal. So I told you what our short-term goal was, right? To go on a nice vacation for our 30th anniversary. My long-term goal is to uh, teach in retirement. And I have, um, look, there are plenty of ways to do that, especially now. I think the greatest thing the government has done, one of the only good things the government has done, is they uh, they started what we call the Roth IRA. Now, if you don't know anything about retirement savings, I'm going to tell you, there are two different types of retirement savings. There is a traditional IRA. A re IRA is a retirement account. So you take out money from your paycheck and you put it into this retirement account. And for a traditional IRA, you get a tax deduction right now for that contribution. So if you take out $5,000 throughout the year, then you can take $5,000 off of your income when you file your taxes. And that'll save you some money in taxes. Now, uh, the government will get that money because when you start taking money out of your retirement account, that money is taxed. <laughs> So that's what they're thinking. They're thinking that you know that money's going to grow and it's going to become a, a nice, sizable savings. And when you take it out, you're going to be paying more in taxes than you are paying now. That's the calculation the government makes. Now, a Roth IRA is completely different. A Roth IRA does not give you an immediate tax deduction. So I can take five thousand dollars, put it in a Roth IRA, and uh, you know I it, it doesn't do anything for my taxes right now. But when I retire, as long as you've had the account for at least five years, and you don't take out the money before you are 59 and a half years old, all of your gains in a Roth IRA are completely tax-free. I recommend that to everyone. Open a Roth IRA, even if you can just put $10 a week, whatever. Open a Roth IRA. Now, you're gonna have to figure out what to invest that money in, I would say for the average person, listen to Warren Buffett. Find a, a low cost mutual fund that tracks the S&P 500. That's dead, just leave it alone, okay? Because the S&P 500, on average now, I mean, it's gonna fluctuate, it's gonna be up, it's gonna be down, but when you look at the past, on average, the S&P 500 will gain 10 to 11% per year. And, but that's over a long period of time. You know, like in the short term, it might drop 20%, or it might, you know, as, as it has over the last couple of years, it might just, you know, rise 30 or 40%. But over time, you're going to find that the S&P 500 returns about 10 to 11%. Now, you can go, you know, you can go further into other investment vehicles. Um, I'm going to, you know, this is just a basic kind of discussion, so we're not going to go into that. There are other types of investments. There are investments that that uh, that or mutual funds that invest in growth, what we call growth companies, uh, small to mid-sized companies that have the potential. Um, you know, if you do a little bit in the S&P 500, a little bit in that. You know, I leave that up to you. There's plenty of information out there. Um, there, you know, these things. Everything carries risk when it comes to investments. Although we'll, we'll get to that when we start talking about investing. But, but this is about long-term savings, right? So to save for retirement, you've got to start saving. And the great thing about that is you take advantage of what the banks take advantage of. You know what the banks take advantage of? They take advantage of the idea of compound interest, right? When you are paying interest on a loan, that interest compounds every month. So you know, you're making payments, but then the interest continues to compound. Well, you can reverse that by putting your money in a savings account, And you can benefit from compound. Even if, you know, even if you just have it in a uh, what they call a guaranteed interest fund, which might pay three or four percent, but you're still compounding that interest year after year after year. So after that first year, you make four percent. So the next year, you're making another four percent, but you're not making it just on your initial investment. You're also making that four percent on the four percent that they that they gave you last year. So you're making interest on top of your interest. That's why long-term savings is so important because it has the potential to grow and, and allow you to have uh, the kind of life you want in retirement. You know, look, when you, when you are retired, you can do all the things that you never can do when you're working. You know, like as a, as a pastor, uh, I, right now, because I have to work and because our church is so small, I am a part-time pastor. I would love to be a full-time pastor. 
but I just can't afford that right now. Now, in retirement, I could become a full-time pastor and just devote my full time to the church. If if I am wise and I save for that purpose. So what if, you know, what is it that you want in retirement? And it doesn't matter whether your retirement is five years from now or you know 50 years from now, it is never too late to get started. Now look, the sooner you get started, the better. You young people, Diane, <laughs> Maria, the sooner you get started, the better. Jesse, Jonathan, my children, you know, the sooner you get started, the better because uh, I think I read this calculation once, and I'm not sure if it, uh, I'm not sure if I'm getting the numbers right, but uh, I think it was if you just put a hundred dollars a week, a month, for 40 years, and your and your account grows at just seven percent per year, you will have a million dollars after 40 years, and that's only putting in one hundred dollars a month. That's twelve hundred dollars a year times 40 years. That's only forty-eight thousand dollars that you've taken out of pocket, but because of compounding interest. That forty-eight thousand dollars after 40, uh, over forty years has grown to a million. So if you multiply that by whatever number you can afford to put away. Go ahead, James. Uh, along the lines of what you were just saying, I I pulled my nephew aside when he was roughly say twenty-five to thirty years old, and I told him exactly what you said. And I, I, I said to him, I said, I wish someone would have said to me what I am now telling you with the benefit of my experience. Yeah, I'm telling you that, you know, a little bit of money here and there, and you're not going to miss it. You know, you and your wife both work. You know, you need to think about the future. And, you know, you're young and you, you don't really think about, you know, 20 years out, 30 years out or wherever the case is. You don't think about that, but you'll be glad that you did. And it's it's a little bit of money goes a long way, and you're not going to miss it. You know, if you don't go to the movies for a particular week or a month or whatever, or you don't go out to dinner, you know, to go out to dinner is not a cheap thing anymore. It's oh, really yeah. not, depending upon how many people are in your group. <laughs> You're talking. That's why I don't take anybody. <laughs> You're, you can be talking about twenty to twenty-five dollars a head, you know, and that's and that's being kind and depending upon your poor bill. Uh, but um, but what I was telling him is that you know, take this money, invest it now, be consistent. Don't just do a little bit and then stop. You know, stay with it. But you'll be glad you did. Now that same gentleman is now in his forties. And he is already thinking about what I told him some 15 years ago. So, you know, uh, some, you know, we need to be good mentors and we need, you know, we need to tell the, tell the younger people, Absolutely. you know, uh, you know, the benefit of our experience, you know, they, you know, and they need to be able to plan, you know. You know, the only, the only problem with that is they don't listen. Okay. <laughs> I've been telling my kids this for years, and and they just you know and look let's face it I, I was a young person once you know back when the dinosaurs roamed the earth right I was a young person and I didn't listen to my mother either I thought I knew everything and of course it is hard for a young person a twenty year old twenty two year old twenty five year old it's hard for them to be thinking you know when I'm sixty five when I was twenty years old I thought I'd be dead before I was sixty five. <laughs> Quite frankly, and, and honestly, just so you know how young people think, I, I, I wanted to be dead before I was 65. Now being 53, going on 54, I'm glad that I didn't, you know, that I didn't die. But uh, but that's the whole thing, you know, it is hard for young people, it is hard for the young people to think ahead like that. But you're right, it is important for us to lay it out for them. And this is why I, I always keep that, that example in hundred dollars a month over 40 years, you know, because then like, you know, multiply that. Like, let's say you put away 200 bucks a month. And look, you can go online and find a financial calculator to do this. Uh, you, you know, that's why God created Google. So, <laughs> so that if you go online, you can Google financial calculators or retirement calculators, and you can find a calculator that will show you what, what is the effect. If I put this much away for a month for this many years, and it earns this much. It'll show you how much you will have, you know. And, and if you go two hundred dollars a month, we're not talking about two million dollars. It will actually exponentially grow. 
So now, uh, right now, the limit on a Roth uh, IRA contributions is seven thousand five hundred dollars. So put that in in the calculation and see what it tells you what happens over forty years if you're able to do that. Now, a lot of young people aren't able to go that far, but that my point is that by seeing it, you know, and, and I think this is the big benefit because if I had been able to see that when I was young, because it's hard to picture, right? It's hard to think forty years ahead when you're 20 years old. But if I can see it, now young people have that advantage, they can see it on the screen. If I put away $100 a month for 40 years at this much interest, this is what I'll have. And then they can, they can add, okay, what if I put $200 a month or $300 a month? And they can see it, they can see the numbers grow with their own eyes. So I, I think we have an advantage in that regard that we can actually show them. They don't have to take our word for it, we can show them the calculation in black and white. Bruce, did you have something to yeah. raise your hand? Well, I think, uh, again, historically, uh, the church has uh, dropped the ball on teaching the next I generation. I was sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean, growing up, even my father didn't give me lots of investment because he didn't have the money to invest. Right. I mean, you hear these investment plans, but you don't even have the money to start. Because um, even my uncle, he was into uh, the stock market, but he really didn't teach anybody else in the family how to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you don't, it's, it's confusing uh, and you don't start early enough. But I think the Jewish community has done a great job in preparing their congregation. They want them to have big families, they help them with finances, they help them get good jobs and everything, <laughs> you know. And the Mennonites, they have done great things because a lot of the Mennonite members start their own businesses, you know? And there's different denominations that have a uh, skill for that. And I think, you know, Christians need to learn uh, how to uh, give advice to young people that these are good jobs. That I didn't think there was any other jobs out there except for farming. Well, you know, and I can't afford to be a doctor or a lawyer. You know, I didn't think. Yeah. You know, I didn't know that you could make lots of money being a truck driver. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and doing a lot more now. You know, so I mean, it took me a long. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. Well, let's remember that that we can only teach what we know. Right now, my mother growing up, like I told you guys, my mother worked, and but she didn't make a lot of money. So you know what my mother taught me? My mother taught me how to work. She taught me that you know when you get a job, you do your best because your employer will see that. And you know if the time comes that people have to be laid off, you might be the last person that they lay off. And you know what I found that to be true. I, I, I have three other siblings, and we've all had the same experience. When the time comes for for uh, companies to lay people off, we are the last people that get laid off. That's why I am still working or the outsourcing firm 10 years later because uh, they have they have now seen they now see me as a resource and because they look they have turned over a lot of jobs when we got outsourced to uh, to this company there were 350 of us not too long ago we were down to 150 people and I was one of those 150 and they were they're were constantly churning in new people and it's, some of those jobs have been sent overseas. And, uh, but because I have done such a good job, because I have devoted myself, like my mother taught me, I work as unto the Lord. That's what my mother taught me. And because she taught me that, I'm still there. And that my company now sees me as a resource. When a new person comes in, they need training. I'm one of the people they go to. Uh, there are several of us. Um, but we are considered what, what they call top tier performers. And that's why I'm still employed. Uh, so that's what my mother taught me, because that's what she did. Now, my mother couldn't teach me anything about the stock market. My mother didn't even know the stock market existed for a really long time. I learned about the stock market when I started working for Citibank back in the 90s. And uh, that was when, in the early 90s, banking was starting to change. And they were turning their tellers. Now, look, a teller used to be somebody that just did transactions for that started to change in the 90s. In the 90s. Uh, banks started to realize that the tellers had these personal relationships with their customers 
they were in a perfect position to recommend other services for the banquet. So that's what they started to teach us. They started to, to teach us to recognize people who, you know, had high high safe, how high um, balances in their savings accounts and maybe direct them to the investment counselor at the bank. I excelled at that. And I learned because of that, I learned about the stock market. Talking to him, uh, I got interested in the stock market. I started reading books. Uh, the first book I wrote or not wrote, I did not read, I did not write a book, I wish I had. Uh, the first book I read was by Peter Lynch. Peter Lynch at that time was a, a fund manager who was like the best at picking stocks. I mean, his, his fund grew at like 20% every single year. And that's, I mean, that's monumental gains, folks. Uh, so I read, I read the book that he wrote. So I started learning about the stock market. But, you know, and now I'm trying to teach my kids about that because I learned it, but we can only we can only teach what we learn. So you know what? As far as that's concerned, I think it is incumbent on us as parents to learn about these things, even if we don't know about them right now, even if we're not applying them ourselves. It is incumbent upon us to learn about these subjects so that we can teach. And and just you know, I was joking about it, but you know what? It uh, it is incumbent upon the church. To teach this congregation, you know, I, I probably waited way too long to talk about money in this church. But I learned that from my pastor. My pastor never talked about money. And he never he never talked about saving or investing because we grew up in a very poor neighborhood. We were all, you know, we were all poor people. My when my pastor talked about giving, he talked about, he usually talked about time and, and giving offerings, and that was it. But I only remember him talking about it in the in the uh, 20 years that I was in that church, I only remember him talking about money twice. Um, so yeah, we have been neglectful. You know, we've left it up to the educational system, and the educational system doesn't teach people about money. You know, I never, I never had a financial uh, literacy course in school, and even now, you know, even now some high schools may teach uh, different aspects of finances, but there is no comprehensive curriculum on financial literacy. And maybe that's something the church needs to step in and, and fill that gap. And here, here's another issue. See, in five years, it might seem to have been a perfect person. <laughs> <laughs> in a few years, when I turn 65, I'm going to have to make a decision of what kind of Medicare plan to choose from. There should be somebody in the Assemblies of God network that I can go to and pick their brain without having to sift through the worldly systems and pay somebody to figure it out. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And if I have a, ever need legal advice, there should be somebody in the network where I can go to without having to pay for a lawyer to get legal advice. Well, I'm sure there are people like that. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Looking for them. I mean, that, that's the, that is the one good thing about, that, uh, about being in a large yeah. denomination. Uh, you know, if you need that kind of advice, you can go to the section of Presbyter. And right. ask, hey, is there somebody in one of our churches that can give me advice? You know, maybe at a reduced rate, or even, you know, uh, even for free. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm sure those people exist. It it, does, it will take a little legwork to uh, to find those people. We don't have a comprehensive system where it would be easy to find these people, but I'm sure those people exist within uh, within the assemblies of God. I mean, we are a very large denomination, so. There are lawyers in our denomination. There are financial planners and, and things like that. There's practical issues too. What if I want to know how to copyright something I've written? How do I go about that? I learn from other people. I need someone to hold my hand to walk me through it yeah. because I can't find that stuff on my own. Well, you know maybe, what I'm maybe you just stumble upon a ministry of right? stuff, right? That's something that doesn't well, require I mean, money. Is putting together a list of, of people who have expertise. Yeah. Wouldn't require any money on our part. It would just require a little legwork. But you know what I always say when people come up with ideas for ministry, right, Bruce? I said you got to start. <laughs> That's usually where the where the conversation. You know, you know when, when, when you complain to your boss about a problem, and they say, "Well, you should come up with a solution." There you go. <laughs> well, you ain't paying me for the solution. That's above my pay grade. <laughs> Well, see, in the church, you know, that's the great thing about the church because God will pay you. I don't have to pay you, Bruce. That's God's job. 
But no, I mean, uh, on a serious note, I, I think that is something that, that could that could be something we look at this year. Uh, you know, putting together a, a, a resource guide, stuff you know that that might help people to have the same look at. Anybody else? But I. I I don't want to sound like I'm coming down on young people, but it's not so much I'm coming down on them so much as they they don't they don't have experience, and they, and so they do need counseling when it comes to money, and I and I think that young people don't necessarily see the value in savings. They they you know they want to live for today. They want to go out. They want to. They want to buy the latest thing. They, they all of these things, the clothing or electronics or whatever it is, they don't see the value necessarily <coughs> building up a savings account or a long term thing or anything like that. They want to live for today. And I don't know how do you how do you get through to them. And you guess this is. <laughs> I have kids too, Jack, and you know what? I, I run into the same thing. In the end, we just gotta let adults make their own choices. Um, and when it comes to young people, we can teach, we can't force. So, um, but that's what I, that, like I said, that's that's why we have the benefit now of, of being able to show them in black and white now what we're talking about. It's not just a, a an obscure concept anymore. I can go online, pull up a financial calculator, and I can show them exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, a lot of times that is the difference between uh, truly understanding something, is being able to see it with my own eyes. You know, not look, I can explain it, but why would you believe me? I could just be making these numbers up, right? Now, if I, if I pull up an actual financial calculator and show you, then, then that's easier for them to understand. And, and a lot of times, that's the difference, is being able to show them in black and white what you're talking about. And uh, it, I would also say uh, modeling is, is important. When we're talking about being a mentor, modeling is important. Now, I, I you know, try to tell my kids about saving and in investing, uh, and I use my own example, because I, I have been saving and investing. Now, you know, we've had emergencies where that money has been put to use, uh, but again, I've started again to save and invest, and I use my own examples uh, because I let them know, hey, I'm not just telling you these things, I'm actually doing it. I'm experiencing what I'm telling you. And that also is the difference. Like, my mother could have told me about the stock market. She would not have been able to explain it very well because she never was in the stock market. I can explain the stock market because I'm in the stock market. I, I have experience picking stocks. It's not, not a good experience, but I have experience. <laughs> Picking stocks. I have had about five hundred. I've, I've picked good stocks, I've picked bad stocks. Um, but since we're on this subject, let's go on to investing. Okay, <laughs> since we've been talking about that. Um, actually, before I go, before I go on, uh, long term savings. Okay? Let's, let's, before, let, let's, let's get into investing. But before I do that, there is another type of long term savings, and that is savings for a big purchase. We're talking about maybe a, uh, a a nice car, like if you've always bought used cars, and one day you want to buy a nice car, that might take you, you know, a long time to save for, right? Um, or for a house is more likely what you're saving for. You, you know, uh, if you want to put the 20% that's recommended down on a house, that could take you a lot of saving, right? So uh, that's the other type of long-term savings. Uh, college accounts is also something that would be considered long-term savings. Now, now. Uh, there are uh, plans called College 529 plans. Uh, the government set up these plans. You can take money, put them in these plans, and again, you get a tax deduction. And any money you take out of that account, as long as it is used for educational purposes to pay college tuition, books, what have you, it is tax free. So uh, I always recommend to, to uh, it's, 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 one second. I always recommend to new mothers and new new parents. <coughs> that they start a college 529, uh, a 529 plan for their, their child's college. Because you have, when, when you find out that you are pregnant, you have 19 years to save for college. And look, college is not getting any cheaper. Uh, tuition is not getting any cheaper. So, you know, you should be, you know, when you when you have a baby, that's something you should think about. 
look, I know it's not easy to think these things. We don't think ahead. We're not, we're not people that, that always think ahead. We're always thinking in the moment and the pleasures of the moment. We have to be taught to think ahead. And, and that's what this is all about. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to jump in and say, I'm not sure, but I think that uh, what's also included is that 529 hours if you want to go to a trade school. Because yes. I know sometimes people will say, oh, well, what if I'm not college material? Yeah, absolutely. Not just for college. So. Yeah, and, and look, a trade school is just as good. You know, uh, who's, who's that guy that does Dirty Jump? I forget his name. Uh, Mike Bro, right? You guys know that, that show, Dirty, Dirty Jump? He, he, you know, he goes around the country and he's, he's finding all these jobs that are like really dirty jobs. But you know what? I read an article that he, he, he wrote once that some of these jobs pay upwards of $150,000 oh, yeah. a year. And they don't require a college degree. They do require you to get your hands dirty. And probably everything else dirty, you know? Because I saw him cleaning out like um, uh, trunks that were that were emptying out like porta potties. I've seen him do. I mean, I've seen him do like really dirty jobs. And look, these aren't glamorous jobs. I mean, I know kids today they want to be programmers, they want to do uh, computer stuff, uh, but those things take education, and education is expensive. You know, uh, there are plenty of jobs out there that pay really good money that don't require a college education, but will require you to, you know, to get your hands dirty. You know, my, my youngest brother is one of those. My youngest brother is a carpenter. Now, he did go to classes to become a carpenter. He never went to college. But, you know, he learned his trade, and he has, you know, risen in the ranks to the point where he's a foreman now at a, at a relatively young age. Because he, he committed himself to the trade, and he makes really good money. Uh, so you know it doesn't you don't always need a college education. Sometimes a trade school is is a great way to get your foot in the door uh, of an industry, and then work your way up. And look, you might find that that company still has like a, a, a college program where they give you reimbursement if you do want to go to college. Some companies still have that; they have a reimbursement for college classes. You know, I mean, there's limits on that. You got to study what the company's involved in, right? You, you, you can't be working for a bank and go study carpentry, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, all these kinds of things that you can take advantage of. But again, it, it's about learning these things. You know, sometimes you don't know until somebody tells you, and and that's why you know what I, I repent for not having this discussion earlier. You know, I should have waited three years to have these these conversations. These are practical issues that the Bible does address and things that we can apply to our, our everyday life, things that will make a, a tangible difference in the way that we live. All right, anybody else before we move on to investing? Since we, we started talking about investing, I want to get into it. All right, let's talk about investing. Proverbs 13, 11, wealth gave it hastily to women, but whoever captured little by little will increase it. Ecclesiastes 11, 1, ship your friend across the sea after many days, you may receive a return. So the Bible does talk about investing and making a profit. And basically, that's what investing is about. And investing is spending money with the expectation of receiving a profit. And now, investing could be as simple as opening up a high-interest savings account. Right now, because interest rates are high, you can find a savings account that pays more than half percent a year. That's a profit, guys. Yeah, that's better than losing money. No case. But PayPal now has a savings program, and their rate is over four percent. Mm -hmm. I forget what it is, but I just I just don't get one. But it's like four. I forget how much, but it's over four. It's, yeah, it's more than your regular bank. Your yeah, bank. like my my bank still pays like point two percent. <laughs> yeah, but you know, uh, I have a customer of American Express. American Express offers a high interest savings account that pays more and a half. So look, that's a profit, guys. Four and a half percent at the end of the year is better than losing that money, right? And that is what we would call a safe investment. Now, I'm gonna put safe in air quotes because nothing is completely safe. If the banking crisis of 2008 has taught us anything, it is that even savings accounts can be at risk. But that being said, savings accounts are the safest investment. Savings account, CDs, uh, certificate of deposit is, 
is where you're giving the bank money for a specific period of time. And they give you a little higher rate of interest because they get to use that money for that period of time. Now, a savings account pays a little less because you can withdraw that money anytime you want. Uh, CDs, you have to tie it up for whatever amount, three months, six months, a year. But the bank is going to pay you a little extra because they, you know, you are committing to leaving that money in the bank. Very much. I was surprised the other day I opened the savings account, and I just wanted to park it there for a while because uh, I wanted to invest. <coughs> just wanted to. And she said, well, this is a savings account that's a money market, and you get 4.5%, mm -hmm. and it's fluid, and you, you can take it out, but yeah. you need like, at least $1,000. Right. And I, I was surprised that there was a savings account that actually gave you that yeah. much. Yeah. So I was, I was blessed. Yes. <laughs> you know? So there are different types of savings accounts. Money market is one of them. Yeah. Money market, and some money market accounts give you check writing privileges. Oh, yeah. They say you so, write six checks a yeah. month. You know? So that combines kind of that combines the the, the checking and savings into like one vehicle, but it, it pays I bet interest. So look, <laughs> to give credit to her. this is this is where going back to the emergency fund, right? If you have an emergency fund, you need access to it, right? When an emergency happens, so you've got to have it uh, available to you if an emergency happens. A, a high interest savings account is a great place for that, and you know when you're earning. Now, uh, four, four and a half percent. Uh, if you don't have an emergency for five years, your money has grown by you know, 21, 22 percent uh, without you having to add anything to it. So you put money in the savings account, it's going to grow as long as you don't touch it. But there's another, I want to share this. We've got rules going to Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, there's another vehicle that's out there called Crash Proof Your Retirement Fund. And I checked into it, and they, you have to start with at least 10000 I wanted to roll my IRA over, or no, it's 403B over into that. And they said, well, you know, because I've heard, you know, the crash, people need to lose half of their investment, but they don't lose your principal. They only give you the gains, but then they stop investing if it goes below. So it's like crash proof your, your investment. And I'm surprised not many people know about it. Yeah. And he said, we can't guarantee it because it's fucking it. You'd be better. So I decided, okay, well, with my 403B, if I take it out of the investments they have and let it sit there, they can guarantee me 3% no matter what the market does. What you might be talking about is an annuity. Um, uh, I don't know. That, that's what it sounds like to me. So an annuity is where you put money into an account. They pay you a certain rate of interest, but they guarantee the principal. So your principal is insured against loss up to a certain amount. Now let's remember that 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 guarantee is only worth the strength is only uh, worth as much as the strength of the company that's that's providing the guarantee. Right. Now in, in a regular savings account, we have what is called FDIC insurance. That is a federal insurance program that, that the banks pay into. This is what saved a lot of people's savings accounts during the crash of 2008. The FDIC at that time insured up to hundred thousand dollars. Because of the crash, they increased that. Now it insures up to two hundred and fifty thousand right. dollars. So if, you, if your bank were to go bankrupt because of bad investments or what have you, the government uh, has a, has an insurance uh, stockpile that will insure your your investments uh, or will insure your savings account. That is not the case with investments. Right. And a lot of times you will see that when you go to invest in, in anything. There is usually a disclaimer on that investment that says not FDIC insured. So you've got to be, you've got to have confidence in the company that's providing the insurance. Because if the company goes bankrupt, then that insurance is worth basically nothing. It's only worth whatever the, the, the court decides that they have to pay in, in a bankruptcy proceeding. So uh, look, I'm not saying it's a bad investment. I'm saying these are things that you have to consider when you're investing your money. You have to, it's, it, you know, some people don't want to take any risk. For those people, I recommend CDs or, or high interest savings accounts or bonds. Bonds is another one that's kind of what they call the cash vehicle. A bond, you can redeem a bond for its base value at any time, but it also pays you interest on a quarterly basis. So a government bond right now will pay about 4.5% a day or 4%, whatever. 
Um, so if you buy a government bond, um, now, and look, there, I mean, I could go all day on this, trust me. There are government bonds, there are corporate bonds, there are bonds that are rated highly, there are bonds that are, there are what we call junk bonds, their credit rating is low for the company. Um, look, every, every one of us has a credit rating, right? Well, companies have credit ratings too. Uh, these credit rating agencies look at the financial strength of a company and they assign a credit rating to that company and to the government based on what they see. Uh, there, was a, there was a big headline not too long ago when one of the credit rating, agent, credit rating agencies downgraded the U.S. government's credit rating from uh, AAA plus to just AAA. I think that's where it was, or maybe it was AAA down to AA, whatever it was. Um, that was a big deal. Because you know what that means? You're going to pay higher interest when you borrow money. And look, we know that, right? If you've ever borrowed money, what's the first thing they ask you? What's the first thing that the bank does is they look at your credit score. And if your credit score is low, they charge you higher interest. If your credit score is high, then, then they think they can take more of a risk and they charge you lower interest. Same thing with, with, with bonds. Bonds are basically just debt. People are issuing bonds because they are going into debt. Our government issues bonds, corporations issue bonds. It just means that that you know they are borrowing money from people who buy the bonds. So, um, and you know the credit rating is important in that. Now you might buy a junk bond because their credit rating is so low. You might earn eight percent on that junk bond, but you are also taking a higher risk because this company's finances are in such dire straits that the credit rating agency doesn't think that they will survive. So that's why they got to pay higher interest because it is a higher risk. And that's the thing about investing, guys. High, the higher the risk, the higher the possible return. And you know that's why the stock market, now there's, there's the other uh, investment. Now when we're talking about higher risk investments, everything that I'm just talking about are, are generally low, considered low risk investments. And the higher the risk, the more you get into the game. Well, not it's necessarily. Sense. It's, sense. It's, it's completely different when we're talking about investing because when you talk about investing, I am assuming that you are doing your due diligence. Now, I know that's a big assumption. Okay? Some people do treat investing like gambling. Uh, when I talk about investing, I'm talking about intelligent investing. I'm talking about if you're going to buy stock in a company, you actually research that company. This is why, for most people, most people are not willing to put that much time. Let me tell you something, if you are going to pick individual stocks, you have to be willing to put in about an hour a day to research the companies that you are thinking about purchasing. You cannot just go by what Reddit says <laughs> or by what is going, what is hot in social media. Uh, I, I have one word for you people, and you look this up on Google, Enron, okay? <laughs> Do you guys remember Enron? Yeah. Okay, they were the hot company at one time. Everybody was pouring their money into Enron. Turned out that they were doing uh, accounting gymnastics. <laughs> and they went from being, you know, up here to being down here within a day. And many people lost their shirts, you know? And so, look, a lot. there were some people that saw that, that saw what was happening because they researched it. Uh, there were some people that were sounding the alarm before it ever came to light because they dug into the company's finances. Every company that is listed on the stock market is called a publicly traded company. Publicly traded companies are required by law to make their financial information public. So you can go to the, to the company's website and get their financial statements. If, that, if the thought of that makes you ill, then just do what Warren Buffett told you to do, okay? <laughs> Go buy a mutual fund and, and let somebody else worry about that. And that's that's the other way to invest the stocks. You don't have to buy individual stocks. There are what we call mutual funds. And a mutual fund is where uh, a company uh, has a, a certain investment strategy. Now, each, each company has their own strategy. Some people are investing solely in the companies that are in the S&P 500. There are companies that invest in uh, overseas companies. There are companies, there are bond funds that invest only in high quality bonds. You still have to do some research. 
You have to check the company out. You have to check their 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 um, their track record. But if, look, if you just listen to Warren Buffett, okay? Warren Buffett says that the average investor should just find a, a low cost mutual fund that tracks the S&P 500. If you do that, okay. Now every mutual fund has a cost. There is a, a cost that they charge, just like your bank charges a fee to bank with them. Uh, mutual funds will charge a fee to be in their mutual fund. Now that fee uh, fluctuates depending on the mutual fund. There are some called no load funds where they don't charge a fee directly. They just take their fee out of the gains before they report their gains. Something you have to research. It doesn't take as much research as trying to pick an individual stock. So if the idea of reading financial reports makes you sick, just go into mutual funds and don't worry about it. Find a good, you know, a good quality mutual fund, low cost, with a good track record. And, and just put your money in there. Now, the other thing is we talk uh, when we're talking about investing, diversification is important. And the Bible actually talks about diversification. In Ecclesiastes 11, 2, it says, invest in seven ventures. Yes, in eight, you do not know what disaster may come upon the land. So the Bible tells you to diversify your investments. Why? Because if one of your investments does poorly, you might have another one that does really well, and it offsets the fact that this was doing poorly at the time. So when we talk about the S&P 500, that all the S&P 500 is, it is the top 500 companies in America. And they're in all the different industries in, in America. So like we have an industrial industry, we have a financial industry, we have service industry. These companies all make up all the different industries. So if you invest in a mutual fund that's invested in the S&P 500, you are diversified. So like if one industry, like the banking industry, had a, a little bit of a crisis recently, right? So the financial industry didn't do too well, but the tech industry has been going crazy. So you know those those tech gains have offset the losses in the bank industry. So if you're invested in the S&P 500, this is why the S&P 500 grows on average 10% every year because it is it encompasses all the industries in the United States. Now there are other there are other mutual funds that invest in um, in foreign companies. You know there are what we call emerging markets in uh, Africa and in um, in the Middle East and in Asia. There are what that's we call them emerging markets because they're at the stage that America was in maybe a hundred years ago. They're just starting to get their economy rolling. And look, you can make a lot of money. If you get in on the ground floor, guess what? High return means higher risk. Those companies could also go bankrupt tomorrow. So you've got to understand that. That's why diversification is so important. Um, and I learned that uh, the hard way not too long ago because I got really excited about this one company and poured just about all of our money into it. And that company went bankrupt. And my wife still will not let me live that down. <laughs> And I don't blame her because we lost quite a bit of money, but I learned my lesson from that. And now I do pick individual stocks, but I also have a mutual fund. So I, you know, I have two different retirement accounts, um, and the one where I pick individual stocks is a lot smaller. <laughs> you know, so it, I'm not risking a lot of a lot of that money. Most of my money goes into the mutual. Fund. Um, because the mutual fund is a lot, it, it's, it's a, a relatively safer investment. Especially since I have about, right now, I mean, when I started it, I had 20 years to retire, and now I've got about 15. So uh, the longer time horizon you have, the, better, the more you are going to be able to benefit from the stock market. Um, I listened to a, 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 uh, a podcast from, from a ministry called MoneyWise. Um, it's, uh, they, they have a podcast called Faith and Finance, right? And it is a Christian ministry and they talk about financial issues. Um, and they uh, always are talking about diversification. Uh, you know, and they quote this scripture called uh, Ecclesiastes 11 and 2. Um, when you are diversified, you can, you know, you can take advantage of, uh, you know, one industry being, being up at any given time. 
But they will. They also came up with a statistic uh, recently. They said uh, they were talking to a guest who was uh, who was the uh, the president of Salamite Investing. This is another ministry. It is actually a ministry that does investing, uh, but it's a Christian ministry. Uh, they do investing uh, based on biblical principles. And this guest said they did a they did a survey. And they looked at, at uh, different 10, 20, and 30 year periods with the S&P 500. And they said that uh, in any 10 year period, the, the, uh, the odds that you would lose money in the S&P 500 were about uh, 8%. There was only, you know, the, the odds of you losing money in any given 10 year period was 8%. If you went out 20 years, the odds of you losing money in the S&P 500 went down to like 1%. And in any 30-year period, they did not find a single 30-year period where people lost money in the S&P 500. So uh, the longer your time horizon, the better. Okay, and now, here's the thing, here's the caveat. The shorter your time horizon, the less you should be in stocks. I read stories all the time when the stock market goes down, about these retirees who were 100% invested in the stock market. And I want to yell at the screen. It's like, why are you invested in the stock market? The, the power of the stock market is the power of time. If you don't have time, you should not be in the stock market. Now, people will say, uh, a lot of financial advisors will tell you that you take uh, the amount of time between now and when you want to retire. And, and that's what percentage you should have uh, in the stock market. So if you have 40 years to retire, no, I think it's opposite. So like you subtract that from 100% and what's left is what you have, should have in the stock market. So if you have 40 years to retirement, you subtract that from 100, you have 60. You should have 60% of your assets in the stock market. And then the rest in bonds and all of that stuff. If you have 20 years to retirement, you subtract that from 100. And no, I think I'm getting that wrong. Anyway, let's just skip that. <laughs> the idea, the idea is that the closer you get to retirement, the less money you should have in stock. That's what I'm trying to say. So, like, when you have 40 years, like Peter Lynch, the book that I read from Peter Lynch, Peter Lynch will tell you to always be 100, 100 percent invested in the stock. Okay, that's Peter Lynch's advice. Warren Buffett will tell you not that that's not the way to go. So, we're talking about long periods of time with the S&P 500. So. If you have 40 years of retirement, then yeah, I would say put 100% of your money in the S&P 500, right? And you know, after 10 years, you probably want to start changing that allocation. You want to start taking money out of the stock market and putting it into bonds and CDs and what have safer investments. If you are 10 years from retirement, you should probably not have more than 10 or 20% of your money in the stock market. And, and if you are five years from retirement, Get your money out of the stock market because you don't have enough time to recover if the stock market were to go down. And this is the thing: the stock market always recovers. When we look at all of the times that we've had a market crash or what they call a bear market, which is a period of time when the stock market has been down for a while, every single time the market has recovered. But it takes time. The reason that the S&P 500 uh, returns 10% a year on average is because we're looking at a long time horizon. We are looking at 40 years. So over 40 years, you can expect to earn about 10% a year, you know, in, in the aggregate. But as you get closer to retirement, you have less time to recover from those downturns. So I'm telling you, if you are in retirement, if you are close to retirement, get your money out of the stock market. And then now is a great time to do that because the S&P 500 is at an all-time high. It ain't gonna stay there. Everybody's saying that there's gonna be a stock market crash in 2024. Now, granted, they said the same thing in 2023, and it didn't happen. But they were saying that the, that the market was gonna grow in 2022, and look, we had a stock market. In 2022. So you don't know, and that's the point. Short term, you don't know what's going to happen. Long term, Warren Buffett will tell you that long term, stocks will always rise. 
And we see that when we look at this. Long term stocks always move. Short term, they might drop like a stone. Like in 2008, the stock market dropped by 50%. 50%. Can you imagine being a retiree and you have all of your money in the stock market and it dropped in one day by 50%? People kill themselves over things like that. If you are in retirement or you are within five to 10 years of retirement, get your money out of the stock market. And like I said, now is a great time because the SP 500 is at an all time high. Get out now. Because that's the idea, right? You buy low and you sell high. Unfortunately, we're so emotional that we end up doing the opposite. Like we see something happening and like things are going up and up and up, and we're like, oh, I gotta jump on this gravy train. So we're buying high. All of a sudden, this thing starts to check to tank. We panic, it's like, oh my god, I'm gonna lose all my money. And we sell low. <laughs> you gotta take the emotion out of it, you gotta use a little logic. If things have already increased by 50%, how much further can they possibly go? If it's double now than what it was a month ago, how much further does it really have to run? So maybe you need to sit on the sidelines for a little while until it comes back down to earth. Like, I'm thinking about that myself. It's like, I think it might be time to get into cash before that stock market crash happens that everybody's been predicting. Because it, it you know, inevitably it will happen. You know, we talked about emergencies, right? Emergencies always happen. Stock market crashes happen. There is no way to, to there is no way to, to to completely get that out of the market because of the emotion that goes into all these decisions. So knowing that, let us plan smartly. As the Bible tells us, let us be wise with our finances and, and learn the lessons of history. Like, I don't understand, after seeing what happened in 2008, after seeing what happened in 2022, why do retirees insist on having their money in the stock market? Because you know what can happen. Now look, if you are if you are a young person, I'm telling you, get your money in the stock market. Even if a crash happens, you've got plenty of time for that money to come back. The benefit of a crash, here's, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip this on its head. You know what? You know what rich people think about a crash. You know what they call it? They call it opportunity. That's your opportunity to buy low, because that's the idea. You're buying low, selling high. Well, how do you buy low? That means the prices come down. Right? So a stock market crash for, for people who are savvy investors, they know this is an opportunity for me to buy low. Now, if you are relying on that money for for your for your lifestyle. You can't afford that crash because you're not putting any more money into the stock market. Now, if you're a young person, guess what? All that money you put in at that point, you may have lost a little money here when it crashed, but now all the money that you're putting in at that point, you're buying low. And that money's going to multiply even faster. All right? All right, that's it. If you can believe it, that's the basics. Okay. <laughs> Did you have something else you were doing? Oh, I just also wanted to say it's also a great um, way to uh, give gifts for like you have young people in your family who are graduating from high school or from college. So one of the things that I did, I wish that I had thought of this earlier in life, but I had a niece and a nephew who graduated from college uh, this past May, and I went online to the um, treasury, uh, the, the government, the series I bonds, mm -hmm. series I bonds. And I wish I had known this before, but like two years ago, they were almost at 10% with the interest rate. So I just checked it now. Um, I, I bought them through their graduation. I opened an account for each of them, and then I gave them the sign on and everything so they could transfer it over to them. So like right now, it's 5.27%. And I actually have like a direct deposit, just a little bit of money, going into that series I bought for myself every month. It's 5.27%. Like you put ten dollars a month in there, like especially if you're a young person. And so, so for everybody who doesn't understand what a series I bond is, it is a government interest uh, interest vehicle, but it is based on the inflation rate. That's why when inflation was going crazy a couple of years ago, the interest rate, the the, the rate on the bond was like eight nine percent. Now, as inflation is is cooling. The, the rate is around five percent. Now, I I do believe those are short-term rates, mm -hmm. but 
you know, I mean, even in the short term, a 9% gain is, is really good. So, you know, that's a great idea when we were talking about bonds. Um, you know, if you're worried about inflation, these, these bonds ensure that your money grows a little bit faster than the inflation rate. So it is, you know, a relatively safe investment, uh, but it, you know, it will grow faster than the inflation rate. Anybody else? So yeah, believe it or not, that was a basic course in, in saving and investing. Look, I could do this all day long. I mean, we could have a semester of courses on financial literacy. And uh, that is one of the things I have been thinking about doing for this church is offering a financial literacy course uh, for the community and, and especially for local high school students. Um, so, I mean, there's a whole lot that we, that we haven't even delved into. But I'm giving you the basics. And the information is out there, guys. There are credible sources of information. Uh, like I said, I will read anything Warren Buffett has to say. I will read because he is one of the greatest investors in the history of mankind. I read uh, when I was younger, Peter Lynch was, was the Warren Buffett of my generation. Uh, so I read his book. There are, there, there is information out there from credible sources if you want to learn. And there is no excuse for not learning about these things because it is to your benefit. Like I said, just a hundred bucks a month, guys, for you young people. A hundred bucks a month. And you'd be surprised at how quickly it grows. And, and it, as long as you don't touch it, that's the thing. I mean, I, when I worked at the bank, that was the biggest fight I used to have with people who wanted to take withdrawals from their retirement accounts. And I would tell them, if you, if you take it out, you're not going to get the benefit of, of the compounding. But, you know, we don't think that way. We're always thinking short term. We need to have a long-term perspective when it comes to money. And, and the Bible teaches us that. We, we've gone through all of the, the Bible verses about saving for the future, about knowing the, the condition of your flocks and herds, knowing the condition of your finances, being prepared for emergencies. All of these things the Bible has touched on. So it is a biblical thing. It, it, it should be front of mind for Christians because it is a subject the Word of God talks about extensively. All right. I, I read somewhere, and I don't know this. I don't know this to be a fact, but I read somewhere that there are two thousand five hundred verses in the Bible that deal with money. That's a lot of verses that deal with money. Why is that? Because money is important, and and the Bible knows how important money is. And so we need to be mindful of these things and stop. We need to. We, and this is something I said uh, when we talked about budgeting. We need to grow up, folks. You know, children are the ones that get their allowance and they go out and they spend, you know, they spend their allowance on, on whatever, right? You know, I know I did. When, when my mother gave me my allowance, I was in the store the next, the next day, you know, <laughs> just spending all I had, you know, on candy and chips and all and everything. We're not kids anymore, you know? Paul said it, you know, when I was a child, I felt like a child. But when I grew up, I put the ways of childhood behind me. We need to put the ways of childhood behind us. We need to be mature, um, not just for our sakes, but for the sake of our children and our grandchildren. You know, the Bible talks about leaving an inheritance, and I don't think that's strictly about money. I think one of the inheritances you can leave is is living by example. Like my mother, my mother gave me an inheritance when she taught me how to work hard. That is the inheritance my mother could provide for me, and it has provided for my family. That inheritance has provided for my family. So we can leave an inheritance for our kids and our grandkids if we make these smart money choices and we show we show them why these are smart choices and where the Bible actually does talk about these things. So you know what, guys? I, I said it a couple weeks ago, so you can let's go off. I know being an adult is not fun. I've been saying that for 50 years, okay? I know being an adult is not fun all the time. But you know what? If you if you know what the Bible tells us, if you have a little less fun now, guess what? You might be able to have a whole lot more fun later, Amen. right? Amen. So if I if I have a little less fun now, then I can have a whole lot of fun when I retire and I'm teaching college classes. Because that that feeling I got the first time I stood in front of a class and 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 actually taught that class, I can have that feeling every day when I retire if I if I just make a little sacrifice now. 
And you know what? That's worth three and nothing more than four, right? Go ahead, Brian. Um, it was said earlier about you know having the absolute newest thing right now and not necessarily like waiting, I guess, like longevity wise, like when you're uh, in the right means to get it. But also there's having, I mean, I, I feel there's having the newest thing, but also I guess waiting in a sense, but also if you can get something that sort of looks like the newest thing, but it's not the newest thing, but still functions the same way anyway, people aren't gonna, aren't gonna notice, but you're still fulfilling that need anyway. Does that make sense? Yes, and, and it's something that I do with technology. I never buy the latest technology. I always wait till the next new thing comes out, and then I buy the old thing. Mm -hmm. Because when the next new thing comes out, the old thing is like reduced by 60, 70%. Mm -hmm. It's also something we talked about, I think it was last week, when we talked about how uh, we talked about millionaires and how first generation millionaires never buy brand new cars. They always buy uh, slightly used cars. Like a car that's a year old functions the same as a brand new car, but it's probably 20% less expensive. I remember the best car I ever had. I bought, it was, it was actually seven years old, but it was owned by a retiree. It only had like 7,000 miles on it. All she ever used it for was to go to church and to go to the supermarket. Mm. It was a, a, I don't remember the year, it was a, it was a Nissan Sentra, black. Okay, 7,000 miles, but it was seven years old. I drove that car into the ground, okay? <laughs> I drove that car, I paid it off, my son drove that car, and it, I mean, we did the regular maintenance on it every single time. We made sure to get all the regular maintenance done at the right intervals. We took very good care of that car. Never broke down. I never had a single issue with it. I traded it in. That's why I no longer have it, because I traded it in. After I had already used it, it had, when I traded it in, it had $170,000. And it was still running hard. And I, you know, I traded it in on, a, on another used car, uh, you know, something that was a year old. So this is what I'm saying. That car cost me a lot less than a brand new car would have cost me. And after I paid it off, I kept using it. So I didn't have a car payment for that four years that I had it after I paid it off. This is what we're talking about, guys. Smart choices, yeah. Was it brand new? No. Did it have little scratches, little dings in it? Yeah. So what? I understand, look, we want, you know, look, I, I want I want the newest thing as much as the next guy. But we have to make smart choices. You know, if I was wealthy, I could afford it. I'm not. If 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 I was wealthy, I'd be driving a, a Ford Mustang right now. You know? Uh, but I'm not wealthy, that's why I drive a Toyota. Okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if I do the regular rate, my Toyota has 155,000 miles on it. Yeah, really? 248, all right? Look, and, and Toyotas have that reputation. If you do the regular maintenance, if you take care of it, it will last you forever. I'm not trading that car in. It'll be paid off this year. And I'm going to keep running it until it just stops. That's what I did with one car. I had another Nissan Sentra. It had 190,000 miles on it, and it just quit. He got tired, I guess. It was like, yo, I'm tired. That's it. I'm done. You know? And, uh, but I kept driving. I, I, I owned my car for, for uh, I think it was five years after we made it. And I just kept driving. But when it, when it died, I was like, oh, I guess we need a new car. You know? So, but I saved all of that money. Most people would have gone out immediately and bought a new car. I saved all of that money for five years. This is what we're talking about. Having, having, just growing up just a little bit, having a, a, a mentality, a forward-looking mentality. And look, I'm not saying you can't have fun, okay? I want to I wanna make that clear, guys. I'm not saying you can't have fun. Look, you can go on vacation. You can, you can buy a nice car. You can, you know, whatever it is that, that you know, whatever it is that, that gets you going. You just have to be mindful of your finances. What can you afford?
Now, right now, my wife and I can't afford an expensive trip. So you know what we might do? We might go to Lancaster for a day. Because I love Lancaster. You know, we might go see a play. Or, you know, in, we might go to Broadway. That's what we did for my birthday. We, I couldn't afford an expensive trip. You know what we did for my birthday last year? We went to Broadway. We went to Broadway. We saw the musical Six. Amazing musical. I loved it. I had a great time. We went to dinner afterwards. Cost, the total cost for the entire evening was six hundred dollars. You know what would it, it would have cost if I had done the trip that I wanted to do? It would have cost us more like three thousand dollars. Okay, I couldn't afford that. So you know what? This is what I'm talking about. You can still have a good time. Okay, it's not about not having fun. What it is is about saving yourself the the frustration that you're going to feel tomorrow when you borrow money today. If you can save yourself that kind of anguish, that kind of anxiety, is it not worth it? Isn't that worth doing a little bit of sacrifice, knowing that tomorrow you're going to have the peace that comes from not being, you know, a lot in debt? Go ahead. Um, we're very big flea marketers in our family, um, and one thing I've noticed, and one thing I've I've kind of <coughs> learned is sort of the same thing. Like, for example. I was gonna say I love shoes. So, um, but if I walk, for example, if I have my eye on a pair of sneakers, and like I walk into Foot Locker, I've learned that it's gonna be two, three, four times, let's say, as expensive. Mm -hmm. But I would I rather pay. I mean, same same look of shoe, same same color, about two times less. Or two times more, and nobody would have been told the difference. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, it, it, there are plenty of ways to save money and still get what you want, right? And that's all we're talking about here, guys. I'm not talking about, look, I'm not one of those preachers that says you have to take a vow of poverty. Look, if you make a lot of money, more power to you, man. Make all the money you can. I am a capitalist. I don't invest in the stock market because I want to be poor, okay? <laughs> I invest in the stock market because I want to be wealthy one day. And look, well, you know, I'm learning those lessons now, you know, because what, is, what did Jesus say? Be faithful in the little things, and then he will make you Lord of much, right? So i got to learn the lessons now, because here's the thing, you know, just because you have a lot of money doesn't mean you, you know, you're going to be responsible. Right? So I gotta learn that responsibility now so that when I have more money, then I can I can still upgrade my my standard of living, but still live within biblical principles. It is possible to do that, guys. It's possible to enjoy life and live within biblical principles. It, it, it is possible. We've got to grow up a little bit. And we've got to be we've got to be forward thinking. That's all this was about in this whole series. Uh, and it's not a word, we'll, we'll continue it next week on some you know, miscellaneous subjects. But this whole series was about thinking ahead. And, and thinking about what God would want you to do with your life. And we did talk about giving last week. You know, that's important, guys. There are ministries that are struggling, that, that, need your, that need your help. You know, all of those things that you care about. Like for me, it's the first thing in church. So uh, some of my resources need to go towards that need. To help my, my brothers and sisters around the world that are being persecuted for the name of Jesus. Just because I live comfortably and I live safely doesn't mean that every Christian in the world lives that way. And that's important to me. You know, maybe you're you're uh, maybe you're concerned about orphans. Maybe you're concerned about uh, unwed mothers. Whatever it is, there are ministries that 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 minister to those needs, and that is part of this discussion. You know, we did talk about the last week, we talked about giving. But that's that's where growing up a little bit comes in. Because I get more satisfaction from, from providing uh, you know for a ministry than I do, you know, splurging on, on something that's gonna be gone, you know, in a day, you know, or or a year or whatever. You know, if I know that I'm supporting my brothers and sisters around the world and I'm getting Bibles to people who don't have access to Bibles if I'm helping people get out of areas where they are being persecuted. Uh, that's something that I'm, I'm, I'm all about. And that gives me more joy than any vacation I've ever taken. And I love taking vacations. 
That's one of that's my thing, because I love taking pictures. But knowing, you know, when I read the stories uh, in, in the uh, Voice of the Martyrs magazine, and they talk about Christians that have been able to escape thanks to the ministry of Voice of the Martyrs, they've been able to escape persecution, or uh, they've been able to provide Bibles to, to Christians who are being persecuted. I mean, that that fills me with more joy than any vacation ever has. So this is what we're talking about. But this grew up a little bit. It's okay to have fun, guys. You know, the Bible does tell us there is a Bible verse that says that God has given us all things to enjoy. Uh, and I know we've quoted that verse. I don't remember it exactly where it is, but I know we've quoted that word, that verse at some point during the scriptures. God does want you to have a fun life. He wants you to enjoy life. But let's remember there are certain there are certain things, there are certain responsibilities as well that we have as Christians. And that's all this has been. All right, final questions or comments before we close. Anybody? All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, thank you, dear God. I thank you, dear God, because it is we can always repent, dear God. If we make bad choices, we can always repent. We can turn around. We can start making good choices, and we know that you will come along, uh, come up alongside us, and you will bless our our efforts to. You are not obligated to bless bad choices, dear God, but you do love to bless good biblical choices. And that is our prayer, Lord. Help us to be wise, dear God. Help us to repent of our bad choices. Help us to, to make good choices, to be forward-thinking, dear God, and to leave a legacy for our children and grandchildren. That is my prayer and the deepest desire of my heart, dear God. Thank you, Lord. Bless these people as they go. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless the church.